If you have your Bibles with you, turn to John 12. We'll take a look for the second week in a row at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This day, Palm Sunday, starts the last day, or the last week of Jesus' life, the first day of Holy Week. A number of things transpired. And I have a confession to make. Wake up your neighbor. I changed my mind this week. You say, well, that's no big deal. Everybody has the prerogative to change their mind. But when you stand up here for 27 years and preach something and then God changes your mind, it's quite a big deal. I've stood up here on Palm Sunday for 27 years and, and I've said that the people who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as he came over the Mount of Olives, were so fickle and faithless that five days later they were the ones shouting, crucify, crucify. Have you ever seen those people on TV that can't say the word wrong? I was wrong, you know. Well, I was wrong. I really don't believe that anymore. God changed my mind this week, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But as always, before we talk about the Son, let's bow our heads and hearts and let's talk to his Father first. Father, I thank you that your grace is still amazing today, and your teachings are still amazing, and they still change lives, and they still change minds, and they still lead us to the truth, even after 27 years. I thank you for Jesus and him crucified, and I can't imagine what a hard week it was for you 2,000 years ago when this day began. We thank you for the mission that he left heaven for for 33 years here with us, and nothing but rejection on our part. But there were those believers whose lives that he touched who were changed and different just as he's done with us today. And so we want to look at those two different crowds. The one that followed him over the Mount of Olives, the believers, and the ones who met him at the Eastern Gate, the non-believers. They intermingled that day on the Mount of Olives. The crowds came together. You couldn't tell one from the other, but they weren't the same on Sunday and on Friday. The ones who shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he, were not the ones who shouted, crucify him. So open up our hearts to the truth today. Father, as we open your word, we ask you to come in a powerful way and bless the teaching of it. We pray for the one who does teach that you would forgive him his sins, for they are great and many. We come to this place this morning to see Jesus of Nazareth and him only. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Follow along with me. The triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, starting at verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast, that's the Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. And that means save now. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified. Remember in the Gospel of John, every time you see that word glorified, it means the cross. Only after Jesus was glorified by being crucified on a cross, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. In our mind's eye, let's go back to the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday which begins the last week of his life before the crucifixion. 
Let's put ourselves there at the Mount of Olives and try and gain a perspective that we've never had before. They're celebrating Passover in Jerusalem. And Passover is one of the three compulsory festivals held each year in Jewish culture. If you had been a first century Jew, it would have been your dream to one day travel to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover at the temple of God. Even to this day, when Jesus and is celebrated at Passover, and the Jews in foreign lands observe the Passover, they say, this year here, next year in Jerusalem. Each year at Passover, Jerusalem and the surrounding villages filled up with people. On one occasion, a census was taken. Josephus says, of the lambs that were sacrificed at Passover, and the number given was 256,000. There had to be a minimum of 10 people per lamb that was sacrificed. That means that there were at least 2.7 million people there for Passover. And Jerusalem is not that big of a city, and it was much smaller back in those days, so the crowds were absolutely everywhere, wall-to-wall people. The news had gone out to everybody who was attending the Passover that Jesus of Nazareth, the man who had just raised Lazarus from the dead a few days before, was on his way to Jerusalem. If you can picture in your mind, there were two massive crowds that day that met on the Mount of Olives. There was one coming east and one coming west. The one going west was the one following Jesus from Bethany over the Mount of Olives into the holy city through the eastern gate. And then there was the one coming from Jerusalem out to meet him, the curious who wanted to see who this man was. And those crowds came together on the Mount of Olives. There were all kinds of people in the crowd that day. There were the curious who were out sightseeing at Passover, who had heard that this man had raised a man from the dead, and he was on the way to Jerusalem, and they wanted to see him. And then there were the devoted, those who had been following Jesus who had actually seen him raise Lazarus from the dead and seen all of these other miracles. They were the people celebrating him as the conqueror, as the healer, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then there were the religious leaders and the Jewish authorities. And they felt frustrated and helpless because nothing they could do was able to stop the attraction of the Galilean carpenter. And he was threatening their religion. He was threatening their way of life. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was riding on the colt of a donkey. As we saw last week, that's a direct fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. The Messiah will enter the holy city riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So make no mistake about it. When Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, he was proclaiming to the whole world that he was the Messiah, the promised one of Israel, the Son of God. And he was also ringing the bell for the final round against the religious establishment. Remember that they have tried to seize him and kill him already on more than one occasion. And he knows that. And yet here he comes over the Mount of Olives right through the center of town proclaiming to be the promised Messiah. The gloves are off. But he really hadn't come to fight. In fact, just the opposite. He had come to surrender. And let me tell you why. In the first century, and before that, whenever a king went to war, he rode a horse into battle. He rode a stallion into battle. But whenever a king came riding on a donkey, it meant that he was coming in peace. Jesus is making a statement here by being on that donkey. He's saying, I have not come as a military hero that people dream about. I've not come this time as that kind of Messiah. I've come as the Prince of Peace. Now look at how he was received by the people. They waved the palm branches and laid them on the road in front of him. Bundles of palm branches were used at Jewish festivals and in the outer courts of the temple to praise God. And if you remember over in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, when John looked up into heaven, he saw a great multitude in front of the Lamb, meaning Jesus, the Lamb of God, holding palm branches in their hands and praising God and the Lamb of God. And then lastly, look at the words they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna, as I said, means save now. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is exactly translated, God save the king. God save the king. And so they're shouting, save now, save now, God save the king. Save now, save now, God save the king. If that wasn't threatening to the Pharisees, then I don't know what was. As I looked at this text again this week, 
it dawned on me that there was so much more here than just Palm Sunday and getting Jesus into the city. Again, I began to see that the Father had something to teach us in the triumphal entry of Jesus about the future, about the past, about Christmas, about the gift that came in Bethlehem, the prophecy about the future. And so the theme for this morning is the kingship of Jesus Christ, the king of all kings. Let me read you Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. Listen to the words. Some of you who are as old as me may know them by heart. You can't take that for granted anymore because our schools don't use them anymore. I grew up hearing them. The Messianic prophecy of Jesus, Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And then Luke 1, 32 and 33. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. He was a king already when he entered this world. For those keeping score this morning, four things that I want you to see about the kingship of Jesus Christ. Let's check them out. First of all, I want you to see that Jesus is a king anointed by God. Verse 13. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Listen, Jesus wasn't the military hero they were looking for this time. The one that's prophesied in Revelation 19. But he didn't need to be. He would fulfill that when he came back. He didn't need to be crowned by parliament. He didn't need to be ordained by the United States Congress. His reign as king of kings was decided in heaven before the creation of the world. He was a king anointed by God. He was the king before whom all other kings in the history of the world will bow. What's the amazing point of all this? Simply this. The king submitted to his subjects. The king dressed himself in the rags of a peasant. The king entered time and space and moved into the neighborhood to relate to you and I. The angel said, don't be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you who is Christ the Lord. I want you to know, folks, that is nonsense unless he's a king. Jesus said, I lay down my life for my sheep. That is nonsense unless he's a king. Jesus said, because I live, you shall also live, and that's garbage unless he's a king. It's so important for every believer to understand the anointed kingship of Jesus Christ. You see, with King Jesus, you don't have any of the problems you have with other kings. With Jesus, there's no personality problems, there's no ego, there's no doubting his power or authority, there's no imperfection, because Jesus is the perfect and anointed king and son of God. I remember when I was old enough, my dad wanted me to mind the store all by myself. We had a family business, an appliance store down in Brownstown, and my dad needed to leave and go out and make service calls to fix appliances, and he would leave me in charge of the shop all by myself. And I remember it was really scary at first. That meant if somebody wanted to buy something, I was the one who had to sell it to him. If they wanted a television or a washer or a dryer, I had to give them the sales pitch. And I remember as a young teenager, when it happened for the first time, walking into the showroom with a customer, pointing out the benefits and the features of an appliance. This is the Motorola TV Quasar with the works in a drawer. Ten in interchangeable panels, which brings television service to a whole new level. It comes in an oak cabinet, cherry cabinet, walnut cabinet. This is a Maytag washing machine with a two-speed motor. Largest capacity tub on the market. It has a water saver in it that will save you money in your water bill over time. And this is a wrinkle-free dryer with a halo of heat. I found myself spitting all that information out. I didn't even know I had it in me. <laughs> Why? Because for years as a young boy growing up, I stood in that store and I listened to my dad sell TVs and refrigerators and ranges and washers and dryers. And when he wasn't there... And I was doing it myself. I was operating under the anointing of my father. And now that I'm in the ministry, I operate under the anointing of my heavenly father. 
The Christian church universal sometimes has a problem with the word anointing. And the reason is because it has a charismatic connotation to it. But let me tell you something. Any Christian church preacher who has ever preached the word of God has experienced the anointing to some degree. And when you experience God's true anointing, there's nothing in the world like it. First of all, you know it when it happens. It's, it's like a... It's, it's, it's like no other feeling that you've ever felt or witnessed before. It's the highest of highs. It's like an out-of-body experience when you're watching God do his thing through you. I was talking to my friend Steve Brown one time, and he was nervous about this huge conference he was going to be speaking at, over 11,000 people. And he asked me to really pray for him, and so I did. And the following week, when I talked to him again, I said, how'd you do? He said, Bill, I was anointed. I preached under the anointing of God, and it was so good. And I said, well, Steve, you're always good. He said, but this time I was so good, I was taking notes on myself. <laughs> what was he saying? He was saying, this time it wasn't me. It was the anointing of God, because the anointing allows you to do things that you can't normally do. The anointing makes the impossible possible. The anointing is supernatural, and you can't take credit when it happens, because it is very clearly God that does it. Do you remember in Chariots of Fire when the lead character, Eric Little, says, when I run, I feel the pleasure of God? When I run, I feel the pleasure of God. What was he saying? He was saying, whenever I run, I feel the anointing. And it enables me to do things I can't normally do. You see, the anointing doesn't just have to do with speaking or preaching. The anointing of God takes place in every area of your life. Remember the times that you can't get somebody out of your mind? And they're on your mind, and finally you give them a call, and you find out that they needed you and you only that particular date and that particular time. That's the anointing of God. Those times when somebody's done something horrible to you, and you can't possibly forgive them. And then all of a sudden, you forgive them, and you feel the forgiveness, and it's real, and you feel the freedom. That's the anointing of God. The times when you're sensitive to somebody's needs and you help them, maybe financially, and you think to yourself, how in the world can I afford this? But it feels so good inside, and then God turns around and blesses you a hundredfold. That's the anointing of God. Jesus is a king anointed by God, and that's why he's the king of miracles who makes the impossible possible. All right, secondly, I want you to see Jesus is a king not only anointed by God, but he's a king misunderstood by people. Verse 15. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. You see, the people didn't understand that Jesus hadn't come as their military king and hero. He came riding on a donkey, which meant peace. He wasn't a warrior then. He was the prince of peace. But they missed the prince of peace because they were looking for a military king who would rule and reign. They expected the Messiah to come and wipe out all the enemies of Judah. They expected their king to come and restore Israel to her rightful place among the nations. They expected the Messiah to wield a big sword and ride in on a white horse. And when he didn't do it, when he didn't fulfill their expectations, they hung him on a cross. It's a mistake to misunderstand the kingship of Jesus. You can be so wrong that you lose eternity. If you think that he was just a nice teacher, you don't understand if you think he was just a nice man who did nice things, you don't understand. If you think that he was just a prophet, then you're dead wrong. You see, people misunderstand Jesus. They did in the first century, and it led to his crucifixion. But when you misunderstand Jesus, it can lead to your death eternally. Know the difference between a lion and a kitty cat before you pet him. Know the difference between a 357 Magnum and a water pistol before you pull the trigger. But for God's sake, know the difference between a peasant and a king before you disobey him. People ever misunderstand you and your decisions, your motives, your mission, your ministry? It happens under the anointing of God. They misunderstood the Virgin Mary. She went from the mountaintop to the valley. She went from the angel Gabriel saying to her, you're highly favored by God, to people 
calling her a whore and wanting to stone her because she became pregnant with Jesus out of wedlock. That's when most people begin to back away from the anointing, when it begins to cost them. Man, I didn't know my friends were going to turn on me. I didn't know those that I showed favor to would turn and stab me in the back. Don't misunderstand Christianity and what it will cost you. But understand the comment of the Apostle Paul, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Thirdly, I want you to see that Jesus is a king, not only anointed of God, misunderstood by people, but a king unrecognized by the leaders. Verse 19. So the people knew he was a... So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. People knew he was a king. They just got messed up about what kind of king. But the religious leaders, they didn't even know that much. If they had only compared what they expected to what they got, they would have known. If they would have investigated just a little and seen that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled over 330 Old Testament prophecies, prophecies in his life, and not only that, but prophecies that all of them had studied since they were children, if they just could have seen who he really was, but they didn't. And we need to be careful, too, and not condemn and judge them, because often we miss what we've been warned about in Scripture. It's good to read the book of Revelation, prophecy of the second coming of Christ. In fact, the Bible says you'll be blessed if you do read it. But when you do, don't chisel your beliefs and your opinions in concrete, because these leaders thought they had Messiah all figured out. But when he arrived, they missed him. They missed him. Don't you miss him. Don't get so consumed with your premillennial, amillennial, or postmillennial that you miss Jesus in the process. You see, that's what happened that first Christmas with Jesus. They missed him. And it started at the end in Bethlehem. No room for Jesus. And it became a universal problem that lasted for 33 years. No room for Jesus until they finally found room for him on a cross. But I don't believe anymore, as of this week, that there was just one crowd on that hill. I don't believe it was one crowd that turned fickle and they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he, and then turned around and shouted, crucify him. I believe there were two crowds. I believe that it was the believers and the non-believers, the believers that followed him from Bethany over the hill into the city and the non-believers that went out to see who he was. I believe in that crowd of believers there was a little boy who had given his lunch to Jesus and seen 5,000 people fed. I believe he was saying, go Jesus, Hosanna, hallelujah, blessed are you. I believe that Zacchaeus was there, the one up in the sycamore tree, the thief that Jesus forgave and had dinner at his house. And he was saying, I'll follow you anywhere, Jesus. Go, Jesus. I believe the adulterous woman was there, the one that he had forgiven, said, go and sin no more. I believe that the blind and the deaf and the lame and the crippled were there. And they were saying, go, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hosanna. Blessed are you. I believe that Lazarus was there, the one that he raised from the dead. I believe that the dead were there who were now alive, the little girl in the synagogue in Capernaum. I believe they were all saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he. And I don't believe they ever changed their tone. One of the questions with which pagans try and get Christians is the question about the fatherhood of God. Have you ever had somebody come to you who's not a believer, maybe even an atheist, and say, listen, the reason you believe in your God is because you have a need in your life for a loving father. You've made up this father image in the heavens, and you bow down and you worship this father image who doesn't exist. You've done it to meet a need, not because he's real. You created God for yourself. Now, there's a number of things you can say to idiots who make asinine statements like that. You can say, isn't my need in some way a presupposition that what might be out there and be really real? In other words, if I'm thirsty, does that mean maybe that there's water? Well, maybe. If I'm hungry, does that mean maybe that there's food? Well, maybe. If I'm sleepy, does that mean maybe that there's sleep or rest? Well, maybe. If I'm sick, does that mean maybe that there's healing or a cure? Yes, maybe. But the second thing you ought to say to him is this. The question of my need and my belief of God is irrelevant. The only question is, is there really a God in heaven? The question is, is it true? And so the point I'm making is this. If Jesus is a king, 
and he's an unrecognized king, is he any less a king? No. Because unbelief doesn't change truth. I had lunch with a friend a few years back, and his brother had passed away, and he was questioning his brother's salvation. He was really burdened about it. He didn't know if his uh, brother was a believer or not, if he was really a Christian. And I was trying to comfort and encourage my friend, and I said, I really do believe your brother was a Christian. And he looked me square in the face, and he said, it doesn't make any difference what you believe. It only makes it different what God believes. What was he saying? He was saying, my brother didn't have to convince you, Bill, of his belief. He had to convince God. There are some here this morning who still don't believe, who can't buy this Jesus stuff, him being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, and that's your freedom. That's your choice to make. But what you believe about it is irrelevant because it's true. You see, your unbelief and your ignorance of the truth will make it a terrible thing for you to approach the throne of God. And you will approach the throne of God. Fourthly and finally, and very quickly, I want you to see that Jesus is a king who will be proclaimed by the world. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The king first came to Bethlehem. And then he came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. And someday, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to come riding back on a white stallion to clean up the mess, to slam the history book shut, and then the freedom to choose will be over forever. Look at verses 10 and 11 again. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know what that literally means? Think about this. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that Adolf Hitler will bow before Jesus Christ and you will hear him say, you are Lord. That means that Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein will get on their knees before Jesus Christ and you will hear the words come out of their mouth, you are Lord. That means that Pontius Pilate, the governor, Caiaphas, the high priest, Judas, Herod, Caesar himself, they will all be on their knees when he comes by, and they will all be saying, you are Lord. That means that every mass murderer will take a knee before Jesus and say, you're Lord. Every child molester, every sex offender, every rapist will say, you are Lord. Every president of the United States, every governor, every senator, every king, every prime minister or shah or emperor, will take a knee before Jesus Christ and you will hear the words come out of their mouth, you are Lord. <laughs> I had a man in his 80s, four or five years ago, who came here to church to visit on the Minfield of Church Sunday on our Colts tailgate party day. I follow, followed up with a phone call the following week, and I asked what his background was. He said he wasn't a Christian. He had been invited. He didn't attend church anywhere. And when I started talking to him about Jesus and the possibilities of him being baptized, he stopped me right there in my tracks. And he said to me, do you believe in deathbed confessions? And it kind of took me back a little bit. I said, well, I believe that those who come at the 11th hour will receive the same reward as those who come the first hour, like the Bible says. And he said, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm going to do. I like my way of life. I like the way it is. And I'm not ready to change anything or give anything up. This guy's in his 80s. He said, when I'm dying, then I'll do business with Jesus, as you put it, but not before. I thanked him for his time, and I hung up. About four months later, I got a call here at the church that this 87-year-old man had had a heart attack and he was in Seymour Hospital and wanted to see me. When I got to the hospital, pneumonia had set in in his lungs and he was literally on death's door and he was scared to death. He said, I want to make that confession that you talked about. 
about accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior because the doctors don't know if I'm going to live till tomorrow or not. And so I took his confession of Christ. He accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And then he said, if I live and I get better, I want to come down there to the church. I want to have you baptize me like you offered. Is that okay? Is that offer still on the table? I said, I'll be looking forward to it. He did get better. He did get out of the hospital. And about a month and a half later, I baptized him here. Less than a year after he was baptized, he died. I had his funeral. He's in heaven today. Not because of any sense or luck of his own, but because God ordained it and gave him the time to say yes. What about you? As of right now, you still have time to say yes. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says that it's going to happen like a flash in the twinkling of an eye. The final trumpet's going to sound. The dead are going to be raised imperishably. The living will be raptured up to meet him in the air in an instant. Boom! They're going to be gone. You ready? Let me finish with this. Today, I'm going out as a man on the street reporter. First question was, what would you do if Jesus were to come back tomorrow? And would there be anything that you would change? And the second question is, is it possible for the world to end? Okay, I guess the question is today, what it would take for the world to end. I've always thought it's kind of arrogant to uh, try and even describe how that would happen. Another bush. I'm kind of shooting from the hip here. Well, I've never really gave it much thought. Probably it would be a combination of things. A big bomb. I don't know. I figure that'll probably be some kind of war that ends the world. World to end. Uh, I don't believe the world will end. I don't think the world can end. So, uh, the world... So nothing. I would say the coming of Christ. Probably going the way we're going. I would say that the, the world's coming to a close. Intolerance of others would probably be the core of the uh, fall of life as we know it. And how would you react today if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? I have no idea. Oh, I don't believe that, that Jesus got reincarnated or came back to life, so... I'd be the first one in line to greet him. <laughs> I think I would spend the day probably asking forgiveness. It's not that I don't believe that's not that I'm the spiritual, but I don't actually believe that he, it, would ever come back. Yeah, why didn't he come here and fix things in the first place? Some of the things that uh, I have done, I suppose, in my life would be things that uh, I think are unforgivable. Why has he let it go on this far? Anything that I would do different personally is I would have made some better choices for myself. I'd be happy. I wouldn't be sitting down here like I am. It's not my kind of thing, so. I'd be happy. Uh, you know, I'm a born again Christian, and, and uh, yeah, I'd be ecstatic. I've never accepted the Christian thing. I would pray extra hard to gain forgiveness. So I'd be like, oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. So we'd be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I could have eternal life. I guess that's the main, the main statement. Or God, or, you know, whatever. A bus is coming. <laughs> <laughs> More than your bus is coming, buddy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, giving us choice, putting us here on earth and giving us freedom. 
But it's a scary thing when we make the wrong choices. It's a scary thing when we haven't made the one choice that really matters. The choice that will change our lives and our destination forever. I pray during this holy week that you'll impress upon all of us the value and truth of our salvation. And for those who don't have it, the value and lack thereof and truth about their destination. We thank you for Jesus and him crucified. I pray that our hearts and minds will be focused on the cross, but also on the empty tomb a week from today. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.